In an information age version of Florence during the Renaissance, during 1969 to 1976, and within the space of just 35 square miles, there was a big bang here in Silicon Valley. The valley was the epicenter of, quote, the most significant and diverse burst of technological innovation of the past 150 years, writes historian Leslie Berlin. Quote, five major industries were born, personal computing, video games, advanced semiconductor logic, modern venture capital, and biotechnology. Unquote. The Valley brought to life new iconic companies, including Apple, Atari, Genentech, and major venture firms Sequoia and Kleiner Perkins. Berlin spent six years doing research uh, with many of the unsung heroes of this era who are behind these landmark developments and that set in motion these ripple effects which have literally changed the world. Tonight, she joins us to discuss her new book, Troublemakers, Silicon Valley's Coming of Age. Next, uh, on this side of the stage, we're really pleased to present a small exhibit just for you tonight of artifacts related to each of the seven Silicon Valley troublemakers featured in her book, Al Alcorn, Fon Alvarez, Sandy Kurtzig, Mike Markala, Niels Reimer, Bob Swanson, and Bob Taylor. And we're very thrilled to have several of the remarkable troublemakers with us tonight. So uh, Al, Mike, and Sandy, would you please stand and be recognized? Thank you. So to tell the stories of these remarkable people and others uh, is Leslie Berlin. Leslie is the project historian for the Silicon Valley Archives at Stanford University. She's been a fellow at Stanford Center for Advanced um, Studies in Behavioral Sciences and on the advisory committee to, for uh, the Lemelson Center at Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. To introduce her, I'd like to share, as is our tradition, five numbers. So, uh, 35 square miles were, were uh, the ones that changed the world as described in her book. 14 wild years chronicled, two books published, seven valley um, upstarts profiled in troublemakers, and two children. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Leslie Berlin. Great to have you. Thank you. So Leslie, really delighted to have you here at the Computer Thank you. History Museum, and uh, enjoyed reading the Troublemakers. So you've been a chronicler of the Valley's history for several de for two decades, and you often quote Steve Jobs, um, who says you can't really understand what's going on unless you understand what came before. For a place that's focused so much on creating the future, why is Silicon Valley history important? Well, I mean, it, it's hard to out speak Steve Jobs on that. Um, so I do believe that you can't understand what's happening today without understanding what came before. Uh, but more importantly, or as important at least, is that Silicon Valley has this remarkable uh, advantage, which is that the history is, is still here. The, the people, I mean, in this room and all over this community are here and quite accessible. And I think that uh, the young entrepreneurs who know what's up, um, they come and try to talk to the people who are living here who've done this before. Um, Bob Taylor, who I talk about in my book, who is the person who convinced the Department of Defense to start the ARPANET that became the internet, and then ran the, cons the computer science lab at Xerox Park, uh, which is you know, one of the two labs that developed the technology that so knocked Steve Jobs' socks off in 1979. You know, Taylor told me that Mark Zuckerberg came up to, to try to understand, sort of, well, how do you manage innovation? And this is something that I think it's right here for us to learn, and that, that's such a, an advantage to, to have those mentors and people who've done it before right here. So these people are all around us, and how did you choose this particular time period to focus on for this book? You know, I, I did something really old-fashioned, which is I took out a sheet of paper, and I drew a timeline, and I started putting little dots on it for important things that happened. And there was just this incredible convergence during this period of time, 
And because in addition to everything that Marguerite talked about with the birth of biotech and modern venture capital and personal computing and video games and advanced semiconductor logic, I mean, at the same time, this is the sort of birth of the celebrity entrepreneur. Um, this is the time that Silicon Valley launches two of its most important lobbying organizations that really kind of set in motion what we see today with the tight connections between DC and uh, Silicon Valley. And it was just incredible. This is when Stanford starts its Office for Technology Licensing. And I mean, in 1970, when that office started, in the previous 13 years, Stanford had made less than $3,000 in the combined IP of its entire faculty, staff, and students. And within something like three years, that number was $52,000, and now that number is $2 billion. And this is something that was happening during this same period of time as well. And I just thought, I mean, what was in the water? What was going on here? <laughs> you know, um, because it had been a place that, it's a little bit of an oversimplification to say it was just chips, you know, but certainly Silicon Valley was this obscure region, mostly sort of gearhead engineers selling to other gearhead engineers. And suddenly it sort of explodes on the scene in all of these different ways. And I, I really wanted to tell that story. And then the, the challenge became, how do you tell a story that is that complex? I mean, it has so many moving parts. So we talked uh, earlier while you were writing about your process and you have this unusual style, I think, of weaving together individuals and time periods. How did you come to choose that as a way for telling, kind of unraveling what was happening here at that time? I sweated blood. Um, it is, so the, the structure of a lot of books like this that you would read, um, and just to give you a, an overview, it, so I look at seven individuals um, who, I think, did you run through the seven? Um, and I look at what they were doing uh, during this window of time. And the way that I initially had imagined I would write this book is write about person A, everything that during that time, write about person B. And what quickly became apparent is that I was losing the really cool part of the story, which is how all of this intersected, how you would have someone like Regis McKenna pop up and, and you know, Regis is the person who introduced first the microprocessor to the world, then the personal computer to the world, and then the biotech industry to the world. And if I were just telling this story kind of siloed, you'd never get that. Or Don Valentine keeps showing up in, all, you know, in so many of these stories. Um, and so I really needed to find a way to do that. The way the book is structured now is it looks at a period of time and it says, okay, here's what each of these people is doing. And I try to also give a window into what is happening in terms of how Silicon Valley is seen and how it's changing. And then I jump to the next window in time and I show again how, what everyone's doing. And that really enables me to kind of hit those nodes where things are, are crossing and the braid is interweaving. Many people look at Silicon Valley, especially from the outside, in terms of sort of heroic individuals. We started up talking about Steve Jobs, and yet you've chosen for this book people who may not have been household names for many. How did you choose these people? Yeah, so I had three criteria, um, and the criteria were, one, the person had to be important or teach something important about the valley. And uh, two, they had to have a, a truly interesting story. I mean, for fun, I almost exclusively read fiction. And I think that a narrative arc, especially when you're talking about something as complicated as this technology and the whole notion of building a company, to be able to take a person and tell their story was important. So I needed people who had interesting stories. And then it was important to me uh, to have people who were not as well known. I mean, when the book opens, I talk about this party that I went to a long time ago. And there was uh, the C, I think he was the CIO of, the, of a tech company with a very, very famous celebrity CEO. 
and this person started singing a little song, and the only lyrics to the song were, I did all the work, he got all the credit. <laughs> and, um, and I think that, you know, innovation is a team sport, and the analogy that I usually use is of a baseball game where the pitcher has thrown a perfect game, because Anyone who was at that game sort of watches in awe, you know, as, as the first baseman just like steps on the bag at the last minute and the outfielders, you know, and the, and the catcher is making this, the perfectly calibrated calls. But the only thing that goes in the history book is that the pitcher threw a perfect game. And the, you know, anyone who is honest about how they succeeded in the Valley is going to tell you it was a team effort. That was true then, that is true now. And so I really wanted a way to tell the story of the people who were just outside the spotlight, but without whom the person in the spotlight wouldn't have been there. Let's tell one of those stories. Which one do you want to start with? Um, sorry, Mike. Um, <laughs> How about Mike? <laughs> uh, uh, so I'll, I'll tell the story of Mike Markla. Always dangerous when the person's sitting in the audience because they can jump up um, and correct you. So I think that a lot of people in this room know who Mike is. Um, but as I've go gone around uh, to other places asking who knows who Mike Markle is, um, not very many people do, which is always a surprise to me. Um, when people know about the founding of Apple, they know about the two Steves, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, in the garage in 1976. And what they don't know is that there was somebody else who owned a third of Apple, and that was Mike Markle. And the way that Mike's story came to me, luckily we had gotten friendly um, after my first book, which was a biography of Bob Noyce, who was a really important friend uh, to Mike. And I, so since I do a lot of history, I knew that there were so many of these little startup computer companies all over the valley, also, yeah, I mean, all over the country, right? And they all had their brilliant engineer, not as brilliant as Woz, perhaps, and their brilliant sort of marketing guy, not as brilliant as Jobs, perhaps. But why was, what was it that made Apple come up? And the more I looked into it, the more I realized, uh, and he would say, well, there were a lot of people, and that's true, there were a lot of people. One of those people was Mike, uh, because when you look at Apple in 1976, Steve Jobs was 21 years old. He had 17 months of business experience in his entire life, and that was working as a tech for Atari, for Al Alcorn, as a matter of fact. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and Steve Wozniak, he wanted to stay an engineer at Hewlett Packard. He didn't want to start a company. So how did those two guys end up the youngest company ever to hit the Fortune 500? And the answer is that Mike came in and he brought with him a cadre of people from the microchip industry, I mean, including Gene Carter, who I know is here. And if you look at Apple's S1, you know, when they, when they went public, you had, good night, you had the president, the VP manufacturing, the VP marketing, the VP sales, the um, CFO, the uh, VP HR. You had the, uh, several of the major investors, like Venrock, like Sequoia, all brought in by Mike through his connections to the semiconductor industry. And that, to me, is a story that is just remarkable, that people didn't know that. And, and it goes back to what I was saying about the importance of building on what came before. I mean, how foolish would it have been to feel, for those two guys to feel like, you know, we're going to do it ourselves, because everyone else around them tried to do it themselves, and it, they didn't have the same success. That's such an important theme throughout this book, about through your book, of sort of passing the baton and this intergenerational 
um, connection. Can you say more about how that's happened in the valley in the, amidst disruption, and yet there's been this passing of the baton from generation to generation? Yeah, and I mean, that term, passing the baton, is actually another Steve Jobs term from his 2005 commencement address at Stanford when he talks about, and it's something that everyone just elides right over, but um, he talks about how when he was fired from Apple in 1985, he got on the phone to Bob Noyce and David Packard and apologized for what he called dropping the baton. And he really had this sense of this baton being passed from generation to generation. Um, and he didn't really talk about it, but he passed it forward. Um, he, Mark Zuckerberg considers him a mentor. He talked with the Google founders. This, you know, he, he did pay it forward as well. And I think, um, and Bob Noyce called it restocking the stream I fished from. And it's something that, that um, really motivates, of, of course, the financial incentives too, but it really does motivate a lot of the people who are angel investors and venture capitalists is this sense of kind of paying back, um, paying back into the system what you got out of it. And I think that that has happened in a number of ways. I mean, it's happened in formal ways, you know, through sort of formal investment or um, through... in hiring people who use or putting them on your board you know that's a classic way I think too there's there have been just informal networks of people taking other people under their wings and I mean one of the nicest things that anyone has said to me about this book was they, they said you know the problem is the problem with the analogy of passing the baton is there's one baton and you know I can't go up to Mark Zuckerberg and be like give me the baton and um, and this person said, you're, you know, your book can, can be a baton for people. And I, I, really, I really like that idea. And I think it's also incumbent on us to figure out how do we make what has been the Valley's great strength, which is this handing things off within a network, in a tight network, how do we make sure that there are people who are not in that network right now who are able to also get folded into the stream? Such an important question. One of the story, one of the people you focus on was at the center of what became a very important network, and I'd like to now talk about Bob, um, Bob Taylor. So tell us about his role and how you developed that story and its ripple effects in many different industries for the Valley and institutions. Yeah, so I mean, this is something that I'm a little ashamed to admit now because I think anyone who knows the inside story of the Valley would say, how did someone with a PhD in this stuff not know? Um, but I really had not been aware of how tight the ties were between the ARPANET and the birth of the personal computer industry. That was something that I just didn't appreciate, that it was so many of the same people who had gotten their funding through ARPA, who had helped to develop the ARPANET, who turned around and went to places like Xerox Park and, and, and built the Alto and you know, sort of launched the personal computer revolution. And Bob Taylor, I mean, in some sense was uh, the, you know, he was an incredible way to tell this story. So this gets to back to my point about, one, what he did was undeniably important. I mean, uh, you know, st start the ARPANET, run computer science lab at Xerox PARC, and then, by the way, he goes on to deck CERC and starts um, his group, develops electronic books, one of his... Um, key researchers. Mike Burroughs is one of the most important people behind AltaVista, which is sort of the first really great search engine several years um, before Google gets started. So undeniably important, actually very unknown. I mean, when I've done surveys, who knows Bob Taylor, it is very rare for a hand to go up, which is just absolutely, um, if there's one thing I hope this book changes, um, is that. And um, the, but what a story. I mean, Bob Taylor is this guy. He has a master's degree in psychology from the University of Texas. And he ends up it, responsible for a cadre of 
some of them were C computer science PhDs, but this was before computer science PhDs were common. So they were, they were from all over, um, all these different disciplines. And Taylor was in charge, and the caliber of these people was so extraordinary that the president of MIT worried aloud about the possibility of staffing academic computer science departments because everyone anyone would ever want was all working for Bob Taylor. And, and the story of how he managed, someone described him um, to me as a concert pianist without fingers. And I, I, that's, that's, a, that's an incredible analogy, right? This is, I talked to about 100 people for this book, and of course, there are people whose IQs are you know, way up here. So sometimes I just felt like I just should turn on the tape recorder and you know, let these people, I'll just print everything they say because they're so smart. Um, and that line really, I think, captures it because he really was able to, to hear the music that was what we today would call you know, per, uh, distributed computing, I think, even more than personal computing. And yet, he couldn't do it himself. He didn't really know how to code. He, had, he was able to find the people and describe the vision and, and get that moving forward. And yet, I mean, my God, he was an amazing person to work for and a very difficult person to have work for you. And that makes for an incredible story. So far, we've talked about a lot of the great men. Um, and it's really important that we include some of the extraordinary women uh, who are part of the story. We have Sandy Kurtzig here, who took her company, first woman to take a company, tech company public. Tell us about her, her story and how that weaves together with these others. Sure. So um, it's funny because a lot of people say to me about Sandy, oh, it's so good you included a woman. But that's actually what I included was a software entrepreneur. That's what I was interested in. And uh, I wanted to tell Sandy's story because uh, she was an example of someone who made this work outside of the networks that we're talking about. I mean, she didn't have Don Valentine helping her out from the beginning. You know, um, her, her startup story is not, I was in a garage, it's I was at my kitchen table. And, you know, the, and gender definitely is a part of this story. I mean, the way that I, I talk um, about Sandy is that she was a double outsider. I mean, yes, she was a woman, but I think as big a deal, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that she was, she was selling software at a time when no one knew what software really was. I mean, people seriously asked Bob Taylor, people from the DOD, how much does the software weigh when they, you know, when they were trying to get... You know, I mean, people had no idea. Larry Ellison tells the story of going to get uh, venture capital trying to, uh, for Oracle, he and his co-founders, I think a lot of people don't know that Oracle actually had several co-founders, and, um, <laughs> and uh, Larry tells the story of basically being shown the door as soon as the word software came out of his mouth, and then having the secretaries want to check his bag to make sure he you know, hadn't stolen a copy of Business Week on his way out. I mean, it was just this incredibly shady kind of operation. And so Sandy, because she's operating in this world of sort of this unknown product, and because she's a woman, I mean, one story that she loves to tell is that when she said she was selling software, people thought she was selling lingerie. <laughs> so, and she did it, she bootstrapped her way up. And that, I mean, that's an incredible story I, because that is part of the way things happen in Silicon Valley. And that was part of the story I wanted to tell. The story, of course, um, extends forward as there have been reasons to look again at how women are leading and how, uh, how they have opportunities or don't. And do you see, uh, in, along the way in your book, you tell about Sandy being mistaken for a booth a booth, uh, a booth babe. A booth babe, right? Mm -hmm. um, about breast enhancement and other things. Um, not for Sandy, but yeah. Not for not for Sandy, but for but, but really the things that were a part of the culture at the time. Can you? I think it may surprise people of 
how gender was viewed or how women were viewed at the time? Yeah, I mean, this has been a really interesting thing to talk about right now because people want there to be, I mean, people, I've been asked some really strange and hard questions. I mean, one person asked me, Silicon Valley, good or evil? <laughs> and the question that I get asked about gender all the time is, was it better or worse? for women back then. And that's the, you can't answer that question simply. The, I talked to a number of women um, for this book. Sandy, of course, also Fawn Alvarez is another person I talk about in my book. Fawn is someone who started out, uh, when the book opens, she's 12 years old, and she's picking plums for pocket money uh, in the orchards near her home in the bucolic hamlet of Cupertino, California. And uh, she ends up immediately after high school getting a job on the manufacturing line at Rome, another one of these vitally important Silicon Valley companies that um, a lot of people don't know about now. So that was something else that was really exciting for this book was being able to talk about Rome. Uh, and she ends up, uh, she, she decides she can't stand to be on the manufacturing line anymore. She says, I had to lay in behind a desk. She didn't care where. And she uh, ends up as essentially the chief of staff to the president of IBM Rome. Uh, Rome was acquired, was acquired by IBM in the mid-1980s. And uh, so I talked to Sandy, I talked to Fawn, but I, I talked to a lot of uh, women as well. And the story's very complex because from the inside, there were women programmers, there were women video game designers. The biotech industry and biology in general had a lot of women, and a lot of women in positions of relative power. And from their, their colleagues generally treated them as equals. I mean, just, you know, one of the boys. And um, at the same time, on the outside, I mean, they were, they were still operating in a remarkably sexist world. And I mean this on the level of the laws. You know, I think it was 1974 before a woman could get, a married woman could get a credit card without her husband's approval. And it was 1980 before the EOC recognized sexual harassment in the workplace. And so this, this is, this is an environment in which a company newsletter, the Atari company newsletter, can publish a short story uh, that is just, just flat out pornographic about a breast enhancing machine. And this is I mean, in the pages of your company newsletter. Uh, and the stories that I would hear that these women were subjected to, uh, to me, I would just keep saying, oh my God, that is, that is terrible sexual harassment. And the perspective was, no, that guy was just a jerk or the, this is just what happened. And so, of, you know, the, the, from the inside, people were treated as equals, or Sandy has always pointed out, she was in charge. So that meant that, and that was a, a, you know, a, a logical way for women to go at the time. Um, but on the other hand, A, I could actually just name for you these women. It's not like there were, Cl clusters and scads of these women all over the place. And, and B, what was accepted as the norm is just you know, impossible to imagine now. So, of course it's better now than it used to be for women. And the way that it's going to get better, still, because it's still not great, is um, we need to have more women in, and actually underrepresented minorities, in positions of authority and power and with the ability to hire and fire and control budgets and that is the way that change happens. Please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'd like to weave in now Al and Alcorn and uh, Atari and um, tell us some of the themes that you build out of the story of Atari. Counterculture, the rise, the the, oh, yeah. the um, growth and change, um, and and fall of companies. Yeah. Um, so the Atari story. I mean that. You know it. So Al's story opens uh, with him hearing uh, tear gas canisters going off on Telegraph Avenue when he's working at a TV repair shop as a student at Cal. And just as an aside, I mean, 
you cut me, I bleed cardinal. But Berkeley actually has a lot to do um, with early Silicon Valley. Um, Atari, a lot of the, the key players were Berkeley grads. And kind of the core of the computer science lab at Xerox Park, uh, those were Berkeley computer scientists, actually, a lot of them. Um, so Al's story starts with uh, the whole battle over People's Park and, and the strife that this area faced, um, and the, you know, the country as a whole faced. And the reason I do that is, of course, I mean, it's an important part of Al's story, and it's also just very interesting and, and dramatic and terrifying. Um, but at the same time, the, the anti-Vietnam War attitudes here <clears throat> were really important for establishing the valley. Um, largely because a lot of the people who ended up going to companies like Atari, particularly if you were a graphics expert, in the late 60s, early 70s, the logical place for you to go was to some form of a defense contractor or the DOD itself. You know, first work on some, some form of simulation or something along those lines. And instead, they ended up at companies like Atari. And that was important. And then on a cultural level, too, you had, um, I've, when I think about what happened at this time, I think about having this incredibly powerful technology, which, I mean, writ large, of course, is just sort of the silicon chip. But at this particular time, it's 1971, Intel brings out the first microprocessor, and you really see this incredibly powerful technology fall into the hands of people who did not trust the prevailing institutions and ways of doing things. And I really think that led to this sort of flowering of innovation around the area. The other thing I really like about Al's story is that everyone knows the story of Nolan Bushnell. And Nolan was the ideas guy in a lot of ways uh, behind Atari. But again, I mean, I'm not, is concert pianist without fingers, is that fair to say about Nolan? He had some engineering, you know, he had real engineering skills. But he, but he leaned on Al incredibly heavily to make all of this work. And Al is uh, very generous in talking about this. Um, because, you know, he feels like Nolan needed him to actually build this stuff. And he needed Nolan to push him to try to do things that Al thought were completely absurd. You know, I mean, there are a couple times when Al tells the story of just saying, I'm going to do this just for the pleasure of having it blow up in my face and telling Nolan, I told you, you know, you couldn't do it. And then um, it works. Al says, it's, you know, it's like the, the dog caught the car, <laughs> you know, now what do you do? And um, that, so I like that story because so many things that happen in the Valley happen in these teams that have these complementary skill sets. And you really, really see that there. We've talked about almost all of the, the main figures in your book, but we've, we still have one more to talk about, and that's Bob Swanson and Genentech. Right. Let's introduce him, and then we'll, we'll talk about some of the other themes in the book. Right. And Bob Swanson's story actually gets folded into the story of Niels Ramers, who is the founder of the Office of Technology Licensing at Stanford that I was telling you about. And um, the, bio, the birth of the biotech industry is very, very interesting, and the way the overlap happens is that the recombinant, the patent for recombinant DNA, the whole idea to even patent that came from Niels Ramers, um, who would be the first to tell you he was just a chemical engineer, he had no idea what the heck it meant to, to build anything in this whole universe. He talks about going on vacation with like a four pound book about under, you know, like biology 101. And um, so Niels nonetheless felt like this technology could be the beginning of something huge. He, he actually drew the analogy to the semiconductor industry. And uh, he had to really, really battle and work through the question of, what is the object and the purpose of a university? I mean, how do you have a place 
whose raison d'etre is to increase the public knowledge and at the same time patent some of your ideas and, and how do you decide whose ideas you patent? How do you make sure that faculty doesn't end up being pushed in the direction of only pursuing profitable research? I mean, these are hugely important questions. Uh, and so, at the same time that Niels is wrangling with these sorts of questions, Bob Swanson has just gotten fired from what was then Kleiner and Perkins and is literally living on welfare, trying to interest people. He, some, you know, he basically goes down a list of people who had attended an Asilomar conference on what we would call biotech today, and starts calling them cold and saying, hi, do you think we could make any money from recombinant DNA? And they just you know, kind of keep hanging up on him um, until he gets to Herb Boyer of UCSF, who is one of uh, the two inventors, along with Stan Cohen at Stanford, of, of the recombinant DNA process. And so that is a really interesting story um, because Bob Swanson was so persistent and um, really went into this without any idea of how, how to build a biotech company. And they ended up building a company that in some ways was, in the beginning, almost a, it's like a precursor to the virtual corporation at a time when people didn't even think that way. And that was actually largely due uh, to Tom Perkins. That was Tom's idea. So we've, thank you so much for introducing us to all these you know, main characters of the story. And I'd like to now kind of pull back and look at the broader stage, uh, the larger ecosystem that was happening. You've talked about the important role of venture capital. Um, and so could you just talk about how that's the, the catalyst that it was then and, and how you would compare it to how the venture world contributes to the Valley's um, ecosystem now? Yeah, I mean, this, this is an interesting question because um, Silicon Valley is no longer home to just the outsiders, right? I mean, it's, it has become a very mainstream place to put your money, to send your, um, you know, the, the best and brightest from various universities, uh, people who want to make their mark on the valley, um, excuse me, on the planet, but also people who just want to make money you know, all come here now. And of course, there have always been people here who just want to make money. I don't want to paint it as sort of there used to be this golden age where everything was idealistic and power to the people, and now it's not. Um, because I think that's an easy trap to fall into, and I don't want to fall into it. Um, I think, you know, I'm not the first person to say that there's an enormous amount of money chasing, um, a, you know, a, some ideas. And that you know, it's, it, it means that we're seeing things get funded that sometimes it's not easy to understand exactly why. <laughs> Very diplomatic. Another, another then and now question. In the book you, today, Silicon Valley, you could say, has, has a contentious relationship somewhat with government. You can think about NSA, um, Airbnb, regulators, and others. But that wasn't the case in the time period and what you talked about. Can you talk about the role of government then and then how you compare that with the Valley and, and Silicon Valley in Washington now? Yeah, sure. So um, the federal government uh, was vitally important in launching the Valley. I'm the, you know, 100%, literally 100% of the early microchips went to defense uses. The biggest employer out here was Lockheed, which was a major defense contractor. Sylvania, Hughes, um, all of this, this was vitally important to getting the Valley started. And in some sense, uh, the federal government acted at, it, through its basic research contract, sort of as an early venture capitalist in a lot of ways. Um, except not necessarily expecting a return, which is always nice. Um, <clears throat> and I think that uh, 
the other thing that I just want to point out, and this is a little bit of a tangent from the government, but while I'm thinking about it, talking about places like Lockheed and Sylvania, I think that it's a misperception of the valley that uh, what may, made the valley uh, was startups. Um, and also people who say that the spirit of the valley is lost today because there's so many big companies. Because time and again, the way the small companies got started was that the founders came out to work for the big companies. And so I just want to throw that out there as something uh, to bear in mind. So after that first splash sort of in the, in the 50s and 60s where the federal government was acting as this, uh, in all the ways I just described, uh, in the 1970s, what started to happen was the Valley realized, oh, federal government actually has some real impact on, on how our lives are lived. And uh, there was a, a two key pieces of legislation that I won't go into in great depth, but let's just, well, one was a capital gains tax cut, and the other was a change in the laws about who could invest, what pension funds were allowed to invest in. And those were relaxed. And suddenly, it was possible to invest in very high-risk companies. And that just, uh, the, the amount of venture capital that rushed into the valley was enormous. Uh, and you, throughout this time, the valley really was seen as kind of the golden child of the golden state. And uh, the part of the, the the semiconductor industry, for example, could make legitimate arguments about their importance to not only to the economy but to national security that led to really significant uh, imp legislation and um, defensive moves ag against Japanese imports, for example. And as you keep going up, you, you begin to see a little bit of question. Um, so the Microsoft uh, trials at the end of the 90s is a good example of how things start to shift. Uh, but still, by and large, yay Silicon Valley is the attitude from DC. But now, whoa, um, that it's really different. The, the, the Valley's biggest companies are in the crosshairs of both the left, who see them as too powerful and concentrated, and the right, who see them as too left-leaning. And um, it's a tough place to be, and I think that some of the questions that are being raised are important and really, really, really tough. Like, okay, so we have a fake news problem. We clearly have a fake news problem. But who gets to decide what's fake? I mean, are we going to ask Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg to, to arbitrate for, for us all as to what is fake news? I mean, that's, that's not the solution. Are we going to crowdsource what is fake news? That's not going to work. I mean, that's part of the problem. We can't even agree on what is real news or fake news right now. I mean, everyone thinks they know, but I'm just saying there are two very different perspectives on that. So I don't, I don't know where that's going to go, but I can say that I've, I've watched decade after decade after decade after decade people talking about what's going to kill Silicon Valley. And it, it was going to be you know, the oil shocks were going to kill Silicon Valley. The Japanese competition was going to kill Silicon Valley. The Y2K was going to kill Silicon Valley. <laughs> you know, the dot-com bust, China and India. And, and the valley just kind of keeps going on. But this is the first time that I've heard people saying, huh, I wonder if we kind of want Silicon Valley to die a little bit. Is it too powerful? And that... That's something new. That, that really is categorically different from anything we've seen before. And I think it's a reflection of people coming to realize, you know what, it's a reflection of the, your phones. You know, people have come to realize, my God, this is, like, this is my, my life. You know, I mean, <laughs> this, this thing knows where I am, who are my friends, who I love, what are places I go to. You know, it sees my pictures. It's... You know, it's, it knows a lot. It knows about your work life. It knows about your banks. And, and that, I think, is what is making people say, wait a second, who, who's behind all this? I'd like to go back to what you were just talking about, this incredible track record of reinvention, um, even despite pundits saying it's going to die and fail. 
What do you think is that secret sauce of the of Valley's regeneration? Uh, so I would point to, first of all, that baton pass. Um, I think the most important thing I would point to is um, immigrants. The, the Valley, fr even at the time I'm looking at in this book, already the percentage of the population in the Valley that was born outside the country is running at about twice the U.S. as a whole. Now, uh, the statistics that I've seen um, out of actually Joint Venture Silicon Valley, uh, their report on the Valley, shows that uh, of the people working in science and tech in the Valley who are between the ages of 25 and 44, 66% of them, two-thirds of them, were born outside the United States. And for the women, it's at 76%. And this um, really speaks to one of the great secrets of the Valley has been, we have been able to draw from the population of the planet, you know, sort of the best and the brightest and the sort of, I mean, when you think of the kind of person who decides to pick up and leave their country and go start someplace else, I mean, that kind of risk taking has been at the heart of the valley, you know, from the very, very beginning when people looked at, looked out here and saw nothing. Why would anyone ever come here? And so, Right now, I mean, you have more than half of the unicorn companies, the companies privately held with a valuation of a billion dollars or more, more than half of them have a founder or co-founder born outside of the United States. And this, to me, has been the secret sauce. It's been like this constant refresh in the system. And whenever people ask me what, what is the biggest threat to the valley, I always say it's screwing down that nozzle on immigration. And if you choose to couple that with cutting public education, you know, I have no words. <laughs> with risk taking comes often failure and then sometimes resilience. Tell us about some of this. It's not everything is up and to the right. That's the nature of being on the edge. What are some of the stories that you discovered during this time period? Not only were companies born and industries grown, but there was failure. Can you tell us about some of that? Well, sure. I mean, actually, I think for every single person I wrote about, there was a moment when they were sure that it was all going to end. I mean, Sandy, you, you, what, you gave yourself like X number of months and then forget it. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go be a consultant. You know, this, this happened. Pardon? She's going to be a doctor. And, um, <laughs> and, and this, you know, I mean, something that I think just, it's really important to remember because, you know, this is a book, as so many books are, about the people who made it. So that it is incredibly hard. I mean, you know, Andy Grove told this story about uh, when he went to Intel from Fairchild, and there was, I think it was a Simon and Garfunkel song um, called Faking It. You know, I might be faking it, I'm not really making it. And he thought that song was directed at him. <laughs> and, and, I, and I think that having the ability to persist in, in the face of those just sort of intense self-doubts um, is a really important attribute of, of the people who have been successful. At the same time, it does require you not to be foolish about it and to understand, okay, I'm going to need to redirect. You know, this, this isn't working this way. I need to do something different, or even um, this is working this way. I mean, you know, the, the story of Atari, where the people inside Atari started saying very early, okay, the, the 2600, which was the famous Atari, the VCS that you could plug the cartridges into, people, this was absolutely the 
the most in incredible, not just toy, but sort of like cultural phenomenon of the 1980s. And people inside the early 80s, people inside Atari, Al, very loudly among them, were saying what today we would say. We need to disrupt ourselves. We need to have the next thing ready to go. And they, they couldn't get any traction. And so I think um, that you know sometimes the frustration is not actually due to yourself. And, and that is you know, another <laughs> sad fact of, of doing this. And sometimes you have to decide I, okay, I need to change how I'm making this happen. So this persistence you've talked about and also this resilience and flexibility, what are some of the other attributes that you've seen that made this set of troublemakers or other disruptors so successful? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a strange combination of what I characterize as persistence and audacity. Um, because I think oftentimes the sort of most audacious people are the ones who like go jumping off a cliff and then when they land, they don't really know what to do. And so what you need is, are the people who, or to be the person who has those kinds of huge risk-taking ideas, but actually knows why you're doing it and what you're going to do if it works and it doesn't, or it doesn't work. And I think those are actually two really important attributes. Um, well, I'll save another one because I know you're going to ask me about it um, at the end. Okay. Um, but I, I do think that, that that is quite important. The other thing that I would really point to is I think that right now, like this book is called Troublemakers, and I think that it's easy to uh, mistake the means for the end sometimes. These people were making trouble, not because that was their goal in life, but because there was something that they needed to do or wanted to do that they couldn't do inside these structures that existed at the time. So anytime you're pushing against the existing structures, you are making trouble for everyone around you. And I think that that um, recognizing that you aren't just being um, reckless or trying to cause disruption for, for, for the sake of doing it, which sometimes it seems like it's a badge of honor, you know, that, that people talk about now. This was just an incidental effect of the larger purpose that people had in mind. In the book, you um, talk about sort of myths that you wanted to dispel of uh, the great man approach to history that you want to counterbalance. Um, lessons learned. What, what have we not talked about that you would like today's technologists or entrepreneurs to take away from your book? Huh, that we have not already talked about ourselves tonight. Um, well, I'm going to mention what um, I think is a really underappreciated aspect of people who really get things done um, in the Valley, uh, which is humility. Um, I think that very often the people who are truly excellent don't mistake their own egos for their products or their companies, and they just sort of understand that if what they're doing is great, they, that, is, that is what really matters. And I think that um, that is an underappreciated, important aspect to being a successful entrepreneur. Um, and also, the other thing I'd really point to is knowing how to be a team, a team player. I think, um, Aileen Lee, who's a venture capitalist, actually she's the person who came up with the term unicorn company. Um, she famously said, um, no one likes to make money for a-holes. And um, I actually think that's true. And so I think not being a jerk, knowing how to be part of the team, remembering that most companies that you can name had two or more founders, and some, like Fairchild, had eight founders. This is something you, you need to learn to play with others. 
Well, let's get the audience into the conversation. The first one, first question is, do you see similarities between Bob Taylor and Steve Jobs? Both were charismatic um, visionaries who inspire teams of people more technical themselves to produce incredible innovations that change computing. One did it in research, the other in products. Um, but both could also be dismissive of those who didn't get it. Similarities or differences? I think there are, those are definite similarities. They were actually also both adopted and both told by their parents that they, um, unlike most kids who came to parents who just had to take you know, whatever showed up, um, they had been chosen especially um, by their parents. And so there are some real uh, analogies there. And I, I do think they were both absolutely brilliant people with no time to waste. Here's a question. How do you fit Bill Gates into your story? He started at the same time, but decided to go to Seattle instead of staying in the Valley. That's right. Yeah, I mean, he was from Seattle. Um, so this is actually something that my next book, whatever it is, I hope to address more. I keep my focus, I mean, as I told you, this was a very complicated book. And so my focus is tight, tight, tight on the valley. I mean, obviously, when you, you talk about the birth of the IBM PC, then I need to be talking about Gates. And of course, Gates comes up in the early homebrew meetings where he's talking about, hey, you guys need to pay for software and this sort of thing. Um, but, but, you know, he is very much part of this generation. I, I don't talk about him explicitly, but he is just right in there. I mean, a lot of these things that we just ticked through with having a co-founder, everything that I've talked about, I think would absolutely apply there as well. Next question, how will the increasing gap between high specialized technological advancements such as self-driving cars or drones and global, uh, and global poverty and the need for very, very basic services play out? <laughs> Don't ask a historian to predict the future. Um, <laughs> uh, what I can say is that this sort of widening gap um, is something that prescient people have been talking. I mean, I find a quote from John Young in 1980 at HP talking about how this, uh, this, not just this technology, but this place is going to completely bifurcate and we're going to lose we're going to lose uh, the middle and I mean we everything that was asked in that question is is a valid point to make and I would also point out the role that this technology plays now in developing economies I mean cell phones um, have been absolutely essential for micro lending and all sorts of other things that are happening. I mean, I don't know how many of you um, ever go to the Tech Museum of Innovations Awards in uh, sort of the, the social realm and, and doing well for the world. And it, but they are remarkable to see how this technology is being put in the service of, of higher ideals. I was just talking to someone who is working um, on a not-for-profit to use uh, blockchain technology to certify um, the, the validity of elections in places like Colombia. And so I think there's a lot, you know, the technology is a tool and we need to figure out um, all the different ways it can be used. Recently you were telling me that you had been in a conversation with a really interesting young entrepreneur and thinking about what's next for the Valley, are there threats to it? Um, let's talk about What's what you see developing now uh, for Silicon Valley? Well, I mean, I, I think that, you know, some of that, you know, we've, we've already hit in terms of the threats uh, that I see. I mean, as I said, foremost among them is s slowing down immigration. immigration. Um, that, to me, is the one to be most worried about. And I, I think that in terms of what's coming next, and the, the Valley has had this incredible ability to reinvent itself again and again and again. Like, to me, that's so much more of an interesting question than the question of why did Silicon Valley happen here? There have been regional economies forever. What's interesting is 
how on earth has the valley gone from sort of instrumentation to microchips to the, the stuff that I'm talking about in this book to the networking companies to, you know, cloud and social and mobile. And now we've got all this AI stuff happening. And it's, it's like again and again and again and again, that sort of reinvention question. So do I, you know, do I think that the valley is going to continue? Yes. Do I know how? <laughs> no. <laughs> you are a historian, so it's, it's um, and thank you for your views on really how history matters for what's happening today. This question comes from Facebook live stream. What are your thoughts on places that are trying to copy Silicon Valley? Um, is it possible to have a sick second Silicon Valley or other places that have their own distinct models? Absolutely. Um, they, they exist today. I mean, I think the notion that it's a zero-sum game um, for regional tech economies is, is just flat out wrong. I mean, we were just talking about Seattle, for heaven's sake. I, I mean, Seattle's you know, incredible. And all over this country and all over the world, you have these enclaves of innovation without which Silicon Valley would not exist. So I, I think, I mean, I was just asked this question in uh, my hometown of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, how, how do we become Silicon Valley? And I think that... What did you say? Uh, well, I said, first of all, you need to figure out why you would want to become Silicon Valley. Um, <laughs> Be, be, you know, it's it, there, yeah. Um, and the second thing that I pointed to, I mean, to take the Tulsa example, is you, you sort of need to figure out what is it that you're already doing that you're uniquely good at, and how do you parlay that into being part of this economy? So, I mean, in, in Tulsa, Williams Pipeline had had all this pipeline um, that was empty, and someone had the idea of filling it with fiber optic cable, and that became Wiltel, which became WorldCom, which got absorbed into MCI, and, and that was building on an existing infrastructure, or um, Corning New York. Uh, that's where the Gorilla Glass and the iPhones came from, right? And Corning New York has been in the glass business since I, at least the 19th century. I don't actually know when it got started. I think the mid-19th century. And so those are places that have figured out, you know, we aren't going to copy Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley arose at a very specific time, a very specific place. It was this unique confluence of a very sophisticated technology, namely the transistor, showing up in a place that was still lar largely agricultural and then having the ability to essentially design a bespoke ecosystem around the high-tech industry. And that is just not going to happen again. And you, to, to say, well, we want to build an imitative Silicon Valley, and I mean, you see this, you can go to places and they have literally built universities with red tile roofs. And that, you know, that is not going to do it. <laughs> You've talked some about unintended consequences um, and some of the costs that come for people like the middle class and others. This question talks about as era barriers, cost of living continues to increase, do you think the barrier is becoming inaccessible to new people and ideas and therefore perhaps missing out on new innovations? I do worry about this. Um, I, I worry about it. Um, I, I think there are plenty of people who are willing to sacrifice for a few years. You know, they come over here, they aren't in a relationship, they don't have children, and they're willing to just kind of go for it. Um, I do worry about what, what comes next, though. And I do worry that, I mean, I live in Palo Alto, and basically none of our teachers, none of our firefighters, none of our police, none of, no, they, none of them can afford to live in the community anywhere, anymore. And you know, people are dealing with two hour commutes each way and we're all dealing with all that traffic. So that really does worry me. 
And then I put on my historian hat, and literally in the early 1970s, people are talking about it's too crowded, it's too expensive. And so I don't, it, it's, it seems really, really, really difficult right now. And, and we, you know, San Francisco, I think in some sense, is really going to be the testing ground on this because there is a lot of activism around um, affordable housing and such, and a lot of these issues, because we've come up with it, and San Francisco is suddenly experiencing it as something new on this scale, and we've seen it in the battles over the Google buses, for example, so-called Google buses. And uh, this sort of question of how, how do we have a livable community um, when there are fortunes of such enormous size being built. I mean, luckily, some of the people building those fortunes are trying to answer these questions, so that's good. I'd like to close our conversation tonight with you putting your historian's hat on to think about another sort of word of advice that you might give to a young troublemaker, kind of the next generation that would be following what is one word of advice that you would give, and can you tell us a story? Yes, well, I mean, this was my word, um, which is hum humility. Um, and I, I, I talked about a little bit why I think that matters. Um, another word that I think I could have used is balance, um, because someone who is full of humility to the extent that they never promote themselves or their ideas, obviously, that's not going to work. Um, I would say that in general, taking advantage of where you are is key uh, because there, and it's not just in the Valley, but although it's very um, strong here, but find people who have done this before and get their advice. It doesn't have to be a perfect analog. You know, you just need someone who's done this before and get their help. Uh, that's really important. Thank you. This is Leslie Berlin, her book, Troublemakers, Silicon Valley's Coming of Age. She will be downstairs to sign. Please join me in giving a very warm thank you. Thank Leslie. you. Oh, thank you.